70 million acres of wide open possibilities. Nevada is untouched. A place where the desert comes to life, the ground holds the history, and nature perseveres. And a little bell went off in my head, said, you know, if nobody else cares for it, maybe I can do something with it. And that was the beginning. I climb aboard Eureka, an 1875 steam locomotive. Here we go. This is outrageous. This is awesome. In Boulder City, I ride the railroad in an unexpected way. Here at the festival, there are over 10 different kingdoms. This is the kingdom of Corthia. Let's go check it out. I go back to medieval times at the Renaissance Fair in Las Vegas. I am trusting this beauty. I am trusting you. Let's go rock the joint. All right, man. And at the Speedway, I'm running on all cylinders. Ah! Pretty spectacular, isn't it? Nevada's like that. I'm John Burke. Join me as I explore the seventh largest state in the nation here on Outdoor Nevada. Nice seeing you, buddy. Good seeing you too, John. It's Thank a pleasure you having so you. much for having me out here today. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Over 30 years ago, Dan Markoff laid eyes on an 1875 steam locomotive in a state of disrepair. Dan didn't know it then, but he was about to embark on the adventure of a lifetime. This is a 440, known as an American Standard locomotive. That's four leading trucks, four driving wheels, and no trailing trucks. It was very popular back in the 19th century. And that's because it could take a rough track, and we had a lot of rough track. It ran here in Nevada from 1875 until 1901. And then it was sold to Sierra Nevada Wooden Lumber Company. They converted it to burn oil, and uh, it lost all its finish that you see here. After that, in about 1939, they closed down the railroad, sent everything to the scrapyard in San Francisco, and it was noticed by a gentleman named Gerald Best, who was a sound man at Warner Brothers at the time. He was also a rail historian. He knew they were looking for an engine for their movies. He called them up, and next thing you know, off it went down to Hollywood. Eureka debuted in the movie Torrid Zone with James Cagney, Pat O'Brien, and Andy Devine. The adventure film was distributed by Warner Brothers in 1940. After that, the locomotive went on to make many appearances, including Ken Burns' documentary, The West. Well, what happened after its stint in Hollywood? Well, it was bought by the old Tucson Corporation out of Tucson, Arizona, and they were building a place up here called Old Vegas. And my wife was dragging me out to Boulder City for a uh, arts and crafts show, and I was not happy about that. You know, <laughs> arts and crafts. <laughs> so on the way out, I said, let's stop in at Old Vegas and get a margarita. And we did, and there was the locomotive with a burnt building collapsed over the top of it. I asked the security guard, I said, how long has it been like this? And he said, a year. And I said, nobody's even taken the timbers off of it? He said, nope. And a little bell went off in my head and said, you know, if nobody else cares for it, maybe I can do something with it. And that was the beginning. The year was 1986. Dan brought Eureka home, and with the help of his dad, wife, and a handful of good friends, he spent the next six years bringing this 22 karat gold painted locomotive to its original glory. How did this get its name? The locomotive is named originally back in 1875 after Eureka, Nevada, because it was built for the Eureka and Palisade Railroad. Eureka is in north central Nevada, and Palisade is 90 miles north on the Transcontinental Railroad, and it's about 30 miles west of Elko. And that's where the narrow gauge ran between. It was hauling uh, merchandise and passengers down to Eureka and passengers and ore back uh, up to the smelters. Located right off Highway 50, Eureka was once an important stop on the Transcontinental Railroad. To this day, its historic opera house stands tall in a nod to the boom years. Now help me with this one. This is 
on the National Register of what? National Historic Register of the National Park Service. And what does that mean exactly? Well, it's been recognized by the state and the uh, National Park Service as having played a significant part of the building of the American West. Uh -huh. Well, in the East, they got their, their monuments and stuff. But as far as the West is concerned, this is an engine that still goes out and does what it did. I mean, this thing was built a year before Custer's last stand, and it's still running. That blows <laughs> my mind. That blows my mind. How is it run? How does this thing work? Well, of course, you understand the water's in the boiler. The firebox down here, Woo. the fire is. And how hot do you need to get it? Well, it's got to be above boiling, so it's above 212. It's probably 350 degrees. What happens? OK, there's two lines that come underneath the tender and up into these devices here on either side. Those are called injectors. They uh, work off Bernoulli's law, which is, you know, you create a low pressure area and velocity, and it will suck the water up from underneath and shoot it in those copper lines down the side of the boiler and into the boiler. And that's how you regulate the water level. As a steam locomotive, water powers the engine, but wood fuels it. At the turn of the 20th century, Eureka's engine was converted to oil, but Dan and his team converted it back to wood burning. The water tank holds up to 1,200 gallons of water, so it takes a bit of time and physical labor to get this machine to move. How fast could this go? This will do 40 miles an hour. Mm. It was advertised to do 40 miles an hour. And now you gotta understand, the rail that they used back then was half the size of what we're sitting on right now. It was 35 pound rail. This is 65 pound rail. Um, the locomotive is beautifully balanced. So it would do faster than 40 miles an hour. The limiting factor is the tender because that 1,200 gallons of water back there is not baffled. So you get a side sway going and it starts sloshing one side to the other. And when you have wood pile high, it's literally thrown it over the side. Mm. Does this have a, a bell or a whistle or anything? Bell's right there. This right one here? Moment. Before I do that, I want to thank you very much for this time. It's been my pleasure, John. It's it really been is. an honor. Really appreciate it. Ah. After 22 years of upkeep and counting, Dan will not part with Eureka, but he will take you on a ride every December at the Nevada State Railroad Museum for the holiday season. What if you could experience your passion and preserve history at the same time? Dan's living proof, you can do both. In Boulder City, there's a brand new outdoor activity that has just pulled into town. It's sweeping the nation. Hey, if your idea of a good time is getting outside, getting some fresh air, doing something you've never done before, and a little bit of elbow grease, you gotta follow me. In my travels across Nevada, I've ridden just about everything. Cars, trucks, four-wheelers, jet packs, even a camel and a bull. But I've just found a new ride that's like nothing I've ever seen. Alex, good seeing you, buddy. John, nice to see you, too. Thanks for having me out here today. Now, Rail Explorers, what is this all about? What's going on? Well, it's, it's a brand new attraction. So we have these crazy pedal-powered vehicles. <laughs> and we're going to send you down the railroad tracks, the real railroad tracks, for four miles down to the bottom of the hill to Railroad Pass here. We have a little picnic area where you're going to wait and then we'll send a train down to pick you up to bring you back so you don't have to pedal all the way up the hill. What a cool one-of-a-kind activity. Can we try it out? Absolutely. Look this way. Rail Explorers takes you on a four-mile pedal ride along the actual Nevada railways. But don't worry about us meeting the business end of a train engine. Rail Explorers works with the Nevada State Railroad Museum, and they're in constant communication. Here we go. This is outrageous. This is awesome. How did this whole thing begin? It all started from a, a glimpse, a, a, a five second glimpse of one of these vehicles on a Korean soap opera. So That's uh, random. How did that happen? Well, my, my wife and, and business partner, um, 
she was addicted to Korean soap operas. And uh, one day she's watching this K-drama in Brooklyn. And the hero couple climb onto this weird contraption and go pedaling off into the sunset. And the shot was seriously like five seconds long. But some light went off in, in Mary Joy's head and 10 days later she was on a plane to Korea. She'd met with the manufacturer and we started this crazy journey of, you know, reinventing our lives to be uh, the rail explorers. Literally. Rail parks are a growing attraction for Korean residents and tourists alike. Perhaps most famous is Gangchunk Station, where thousands flock to ride carts similar to this one. It's no wonder Alex and Mary Joy were so entranced by them. What was it about Boulder City that attracted you to this area? First of all, look around you. I mean, this is spectacular. And we have this beautiful railroad that's running right through this incredible desert landscape. Also, Boulder City is really becoming this kind of outdoor adventure, experience-based destination. Where else in the country are you doing this? This is the fleet from our Rhode Island location. So we're actually snowbirding the entire business here until the end of April. We're gonna come back in November. So for the summer months, we're gonna be operating in Rhode Island, just outside of Newport. And then this year, we're very excited also to be opening in the Catskills in New York. What would you say this is most like? You know, it's, it's one of those truly unique things. Um, it's, it's like being on a train, but it's not like being on a train. You have this full sphere of vision. Um, you're not looking through a window. It's a bit like riding a bicycle, but it's not like riding a bicycle because you, know, you, know, you don't have to look where you're going. You can be taking pictures and uh, yeah. you, you're, not, you're not steering or looking for potholes. The rails are just guiding you along. How many people have done this? Since we opened in 2015, total ridership is somewhere around about 65,000. And what has the response been? I, I'm yet to find somebody who refuses to smile at least somewhere through the journey. <laughs> the cars used by rail explorers are the newest advancement in rail travel tech, which has been around since the 1850s. The cars move along with incredible ease. Anyone from the youngest children to the oldest grandparent can enjoy the ride. I gotta tell you, I didn't know what to expect. I, uh, even when I saw these things, I'm like, I don't, what, how is this gonna go? A thousand times better than, than I could explain or than I expected. That was incredible. That's what we love to hear. Give me your thoughts of Nevada. What do you think now that you're, you're here and you're an entrepreneur? You know, I love it. There are actually a lot of elements that remind me of Australia. The, the big open spaces, the massive skies, the sunsets. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I'm, I, you know, maybe I won't go back to Rhode Island in the summer. <laughs> I hear you. Well, as good as Nevada is, you just made it greater with this. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate You're it. You're really welcome. I'm going to go catch that train. Okay. After hundreds of adventures traveling all across the state of Nevada, you would think I've seen it all. But it just goes to show, this state never runs out of surprises. You know what I love? The old days, when people would say things like, my lord, my lady, they fight with swords. There's only one thing better than that. That's to come here to the Age of Chivalry Festival in Las Vegas, Nevada, with 50,000 other people who are going back in time and experiencing it firsthand. Everyone knows the legends of King Arthur in the Kingdom of Camelot, a shining city of magical perfection, where the only thing stronger than the castle walls was the knight's coat of chivalry. Here, one can get a taste of that fantasy for themselves. Here at the festival, there are over 10 different kingdoms. This is the kingdom of Corthia. Let's go check it out. The kingdoms of the age of chivalry are dedicated groups who use their unique talents and knowledge to bring wonderment to festival guests. Bound by their motto, many hands, one heart, the members of the kingdom of Corithia entertain with historical reenactments of combat and performing arts. Everywhere you look, there's merchants, song and dance, amazing displays of skill and craftsmanship. How did this all come about? Well, for answers, the only place to go is to the top. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited. This is such a rare thing. I have an audience with the king, King Nate, sir. Yes. Thank you very much for having time with me today. I don't have much time, so how can I help you? Well, tell me about your festival. How many people come? Where do they this come from? This is the Age of Chivalry Renaissance Festival. It's been going on for some 20 plus years here in the, uh, the encampment known as Sunset Park. And, and what happens at this festival exactly? Oh, what doesn't happen? After hours, it becomes somewhat bawdy. <laughs> but during the day, we encourage families. There are jousting tournaments. There's music. There is merriment. There is food. All kinds of demonstrations of craft and periods of history represented here. Nate Tannenbaum may be a mild-mannered man outside of this park, but for over 10 years, he's been transformed into the reigning king of the festival. He says he can have me beheaded at any time he wishes, and he may be joking, but hey, I'm not gonna press my luck. What about the encampments? I see that tents are put up and yes, people stay here. Spread throughout the realm. There are those who camp out here in uh, tent villages that they construct themselves. And it is good to see so many different ages here at the festival, is it not? Yes, uh, from people who are older than yourself and myself, to the little ones, and they are dressed in costume, we feel it incumbent to address them as fair princesses and fair princes. We think it may be a memory that they will have of learning something about history. This will be a memory I'll have forever. The clothing, it's all terrific. And, and what is about to happen here now, King? We are gathering for the joust. For the joust? Yes, there's much royalty. You hear the drum beat. You don't know, but they may be coming for you. I think... It's time for the joust. Thank you, King Date. What a and, pleasure. Uh, uh, safe travels. Thank you, sir. The joust and many other combat exhibitions remain a highlight of the festival. With all the archers, sword masters, and folks on horseback, I can't help but wonder what goes on behind the scenes. One very special noble has deigned to give me a peek behind the curtain. Subjects of the kingdom. I have something very special for you today. I have an audience with the Empress Anastasia of Umbria. Empress, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, well met, my lord. I'm glad you're here. What is the difference between an empress and a queen? <laughs> uh, the queens are beneath the empress in that I actually get to help them learn to become queens and to help them give them a place to play. I see so many costumes and, and people wearing yes. such great clothing. It's one of the best parts of this festival. Tell Absolutely. me where it comes from. Most people tend to make their own creations. A lot of people learn to sew and things. I have found it's a lot easier to get what I want if I do it myself. <laughs> you make this yourself? Yes. Thank you. And, and how much does this weigh? <laughs> um, this gown in particular is around 35 pounds, but we're adding in the corsets and the hoops and all of the layers that go underneath it. it, it it's quite an ordeal to get dressed. My most heavy gown is probably around 56 pounds. Empress Anastasia takes great joy in the craft of the festival, having made her own dress in countless other period costumes. But more precious than the craft, the people and the personal connections are what really make the age of chivalry something else. My husband and I actually met at fair. I had been hired to be queen of fair as an actress, and they set up a publicity stunt and had me hauled off in a little wooden cart like some sort of chollop. Um, one of the queens was afraid that it was not in good fun. She was not aware that it was a publicity stunt. She called for an emergency evac rescue. <laughs> he brought his entire army to rescue me out of a cage. And that's when we actually met. That is the sweetest <laughs> story it ever. It is, and we're still together. We um, got married here, so this is kind of our anniversary event. When I see this festival mm -hmm. here in the kingdom, I see a lot of passion, passion for, where do you think this <laughs> comes from? What is this passion about? A lot of it is the love of history. A lot of people love to, to sparkle and shine, and you can't be somebody different unless you feel like you're somewhere else. And this really gives you a chance to kind of be transported back in time, even if it's only for a few days. The clothing, <laughs> the feathers, the decorations, they're such a part of this festival. But, your Empress, I'm so sorry. I'm just a, a, a mere peasant. I, I haven't the clothes to be worthy in your presence. I, I apologize. Well, we can fix that. Can you? I do. I have clothing that would fit you if you would like to try. Would I like to try? <laughs> I most certainly would. Thank you so much, Empress. Absolutely. Well, let's get you dressed. Let's go. At the age of chivalry, I can't help but want to join in the fun, to escape to another time and be a different person. At last, I look the part.
And now, now I feel like I'm part of the kingdom. Or I'm on a deck of playing cards. Either way, you've got to go. There are no cameras in the 1500s. I need a turkey leg. The adrenaline-fueled action of performance race cars has captured the imaginations of auto fans for decades. Engines rev at the starting line, pumping and thumping in time. Finally, the flags go up and the drivers burst forth into a grueling sport of endurance, speed and precision control. Getting behind the wheel of one of these machines seemed like only a dream, until today. Let's see, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Porsche, which one am I gonna drive today? Oh, give me a break, Burke. You're not driving any of those cars. Oh, contraire, my friend. I will be driving one of these cars. I'm here at Dream Racing at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway, and this is Steve. He works here. Nice seeing you, hey, buddy. nice to meet you. How are you? Great. Now, tell me about this experience. OK, well, Dream Racing, we're here at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Um, we've been in operation for about six years, um, and we have the world's largest selection of supercars and GT race cars. Uh, so you can actually come down and drive your dream car on our racetrack. And how fast can I go out on the track? Depending on how good you are, you can probably get up to about 140 miles per hour on the main straight, 145 if you're really good. But as we're a road course, a nine-turn road course, it's more about the thrills of turning and accelerating and braking all through the course. You may think that race drivers can simply get in the car and go, but there's so much more involved. In their downtime, drivers strive to increase their endurance and hand-eye coordination. The whole idea of this is so you understand the commands you're going to be given by the instructor. You learn the turns, you learn the braking points, where to accelerate. You've got all the controls available to you that you will be in, in a normal car. The only thing we're lacking is, 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 is physics being applied to you. So it might feel a little bit strange, but... So the biggest question is, how do I look? I, pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. We'll see. <laughs> all right, what do we do? OK, so you're just going to tap the gas for me. OK, you're going to upshift into first gear. That's right. And you're going to accelerate out. Wow. Get to the left. <laughs> Build your gas a little bit more. OK, keep applying gas. 60, 70, 80% gas. All the way up to 100% gas for me. Out to the left-hand side. Upshift to third gear. This is unbelievable. So a little bit more gas. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. All the way to the left-hand side of the track. Keep going. Brake, 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 brake. Down, shift to third gear. Ah, uh, died. And turn in on the apex of the corner. Full gas for me. This is harder than it looks. It's not easy. It's fun, though. Well, Steve, I'm out of quarters. Should we head on out? Yeah, let's get you out there and put you in a real car. Let's go. Apprehension mounts on the way to the car. The simulator helps train you, but it also shows you how far away you are from being ready. I'm not sure my insurance covers dinging up a $200,000 dream car. Luckily, I'm in the hands of the pros. You know, the thrill of dream racing is getting in the car and going around the track. The relief is that they give you a really good driver to go with you and instruct you along the way. This is JT. Nice to see you, buddy. How you guys doing? JB, you excited? Uh, man, I'm, I'm off the hook. I can't there tell you. There you go. JT Montes brings his racing expertise to the table. Knowledgeable about the track, the vehicles, and how they work together, he's here to get drivers literally up to speed and racing safely through the turns of the course. And you're, you're a professional driver. How many times have you been around this track? 100,000 plus. <laughs> That'll <laughs> work. <laughs> Put hey, it that I, way. I chose the Lamborghini. Tell me about this car. All-wheel drive, 570 horsepower. Now you're on racing slick tires compared to your normal car, truck, wagon, or van at home. This thing can grip and rip around the racetrack. Like I said, biggest thing, have confidence in what this car can do, and we'll keep picking it up lap after lap. I am trusting this beauty. I am trusting you. Let's go rock the joint. All right, man. My car of choice is the Lamborghini Gallardo. Those 570 horses JT mentioned reveal themselves in every move this thing makes. Speed is a Lamborghini's heritage. A carbon fiber shell helps make this the lightest road legal Lamborghini in its range. Only 2,800 pounds sit on a 5.2 liter V10 engine. In layman's terms, this thing is fast. Racing feels surreal. The car and the speed are in a caliber beyond anything I've experienced before, and it's painfully obvious at first. 
JT helps me deftly maneuver and muscle over the pavement. A few laps in, and suddenly we're pouring through the turns. JT, that was awesome, baby. That was Glad awesome. Jordan, man. Pleasure. All right, hit me top speed. How'd I do? About 120 miles an hour is what you topped out at down at the end of the straightaway. Not you know? bad, right? No, no, not for a rookie, not for the first time on track. And I got to tell you, you know, you're going fast. It feels even faster. But you were right in my ear telling me exactly what to do. I felt totally confident the whole time. You said boosting your confidence lead each and every lap out there. That's what we're here for. Now that I figure we've been through this together and we're friends and all and we bonded, let's go again. Let's go. Let's do Fire it. Fire it up. Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Jaguar Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno. Inspiring the spirit of adventure with confidence in any terrain or conditions. Information at jlrlv.com or jlrreno.com.